Welcome to the Hey Docs podcast with your host, Jill Allen. Today, I am joined by Luke Infinger from Hip Creative. From budget to strategy to sales training, we are talking all things marketing. In this episode, Luke is sharing the inside scoop on the best ways to use your marketing budget, no matter the size of your practice. Let's get into it. Hey, Docs. When it comes to marketing, I keep hearing that you're frustrated and that you don't know what you're paying for or even if your marketing efforts are working. Are you wondering what your next marketing move should be? I would suggest you contact Mary Kay Miller and her team at Kaleidoscope. With their free digital marketing audit, you will get answers and solutions to your biggest marketing questions. Go to contact Kale dot com to request your free digital marketing audit today. When it comes to websites, SEO, and digital advertising, you don't know what you don't know till you know. Find out what you don't know today. That's contact kl.com. Luke, I am so excited to have you on Hey Docs. I've been looking forward to recording with you. So thanks for being here today. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. Super excited. Yes, this is going to be a great episode. And I know anybody who's out there listening is sitting on the edge of their seats being like, all right, what information <laughs> is he going to drop on us? So I'm wondering in the event that somebody doesn't know who you are or doesn't know much about Hip Creative, I'm wondering if you can just give us a little background on yourself and the company. Sure, sure. I'll give just a couple minutes of an intro. So my background is actually on the creative and design side. I wanted to become a designer and had done that for different companies, worked in the church world, that type of thing. And just in getting more serious around that, decided to go off to school. So I went to Savannah College of Art and Design, SCAD in Savannah, Georgia, studied motion graphics. I was there for a little over two years. Then I went to work in New York in a motion design studio in Chelsea. And within six to eight months, I totally hated my job. I totally hated it. And I worked there for about a year. I was in New York for a little over a year. And at the time, I had started to date an old friend. So this friend, we had been friends since I was like 15 years old. This is about 11 and a half years ago. And so she was graduating from the University of Alabama. I hated my job. So we decided to come back to Pensacola, Florida, which was home base for both of us. Our families are here. We ended up getting married. We've been married for over 10 years now. Now we have two kids. And I thought I would be back in Pensacola for a couple months. It's a small town. It's come a long way, but mm -hmm. I thought I'll be back in L.A. or in New York and doing something else. But I really started to lean into strengths that I always had. So being persistent, really focusing on helping people with their long term goals, being a part of something rather than a tactical skill. Mm -hmm. And so I moved away from having to be a designer to I was selling design jobs, but really I was creating relationships with companies and saying, hey, what's your long-term goal? Where do you see the company in two to three years? And let me work with you to get there. And that kind of turned into HIP in August will be 10 years old. So myself, my wife, and the other co-founder, Justin Huell, I started running into tech issues. And so my wife is, hey, you should chat with my cousin, Justin. And so that's how Justin and myself got linked up. He's really good on the tech side. He grew up in small business. So finance, tech, operations is his thing. And it just naturally grew. We thought it would be a local agency, but we quickly started working in medical and the Andrews Institute, if you know anything about sports medicine, orthopedic, the orthopedic space, Dr. James Andrews is probably one of the biggest orthopedists in sports medicine, and he has an institute here in Gulf Breeze, which is basically mm -hmm. our backyard. We started working with orthopedists who wanted to remain independent because at the time they were really being strong armed by the hospital system who was cutting off their referrals and saying, hey, come work for us or you won't have patients. Sure. So we helped a number of them remain independent and Long story short, that's how Dr. Ben Fishbein found out about us. He's here in the Pensacola area now, spread mm -hmm. across the panhandle. Yep. 
And we courted each other for about a year. So he found out about us in 2015. We met several times, looked like we may work together. And then it just was, timing wasn't right. Timing became right, I think it was Q1 of 2026. Mm -hmm. And most people know his story. For those who don't, he grew very rapidly. And a lot of people wanted to know how he did it. And we became a part of his story. He started his own event, Fishbine Fundamentals, and we just rode the wave and I'm wrapping up. So I know this is a, a long intro, oh, but no, this is great. Around, perfect. Around the 2018, 2019 mark, we knew we had to niche down because we wanted to align marketing with operations. And to do that, orthopedic, pain management, all these things, while they're very similar, they're also very different. And so we decided to just solely focus in orthodontics to really hone in and understand that business model the best that we could and create multiple things around that. So we've created a software around that, a secret shop tool around that, some curriculum. And really our goal is just to make sure that the marketing actually works because I'd love to sit here and say every single client has blown it out of the water with us. It's not true. A lot have, but some haven't. And my goal is to, and really what I'm passionate about, even if I'm just speaking like this on a podcast, is helping orthodontists make sure that their marketing actually works because marketing yes. can be a pretty dirty word where we see all these guarantees on Facebook, 30 patients guaranteed or... I tried Facebook ads, but it doesn't work for me, or I wasted all this money. The truth is, and we can unpack this, the truth is a lot of times it's not the marketing. In some cases it is, but in a lot of cases it's not. Yeah. Yeah. And I am excited to unpack that because I, th I think that's going to be something that the audience really wants to hear. But before we go down that road, I do want to talk to you a little bit I've been in the industry for quite a while now as, as well. And I definitely think we could both agree, even from the time when you got in and really started focusing on the orthodontic side of some of the marketing that you guys do, that we yeah. have seen some big changes in our industry and in how we are m marketing. And, and I think there has even been, I think maybe even a significant change in pre-COVID and how we marketed mm -hmm. and post COVID and how we are marketing now. And I believe there's still continued change that's coming. I, I don't think we will ever be in a static position with marketing. I think we're ever evolving when it comes to what we're doing with our practices and mm -hmm. just where technology is taking us. But I'm wondering if you can talk to that because when I think of HIP and I think of your group, I do feel like you guys have got a really good pulse on where things are going. And I'm going to say are pretty proactive to not mm -hmm. falling into that trap of this is what we've done for the last 10 years. And this is the still material we're putting out. Like some companies can get trapped in. So I'm yeah. wondering if you can talk a little bit about successful marketing strategies that sure. are happening now that maybe we didn't have to think as much about even as, as early as just some of those post-COVID years within the last eight. The way that I see it post-COVID is it's just become so much more competitive. And there's a lot of reasons why. I remember the first ad that I ever ran, again, starting about 10 years ago, Facebook was like the Wild West. You mm -hmm. could target religion. You could target square footage of home. You could target credit scores, all these things. And... There wasn't so much regulation. Now, regulation and some of those things in terms of changes have been good because a lot of the spammy offers and, and things like that are not allowed, even though some still run, but they quickly get shut down. Maybe there's an orthodontist yeah. even listening and their page has been deactivated or these things. It used to be the Wild West and it was a bit easier for sure. But that's not the only challenge. When I think back and I hear stories from orthodontists or dentists 20 years ago, they weren't even allowed to advertise. They were like measuring the sign on their building because it could only be so big. And so from there, yep. 
you move into that changed and there was traditional advertising and mailers and billboards and TV and all this, then there's the internet and that brought forth a ton of options. And then when you move into really just the competitive landscape with corporate entities, DSOs, OSOs, now dentists becoming a large competitor on the aligner side, there's so much more noise and there's things like in, in really the past couple of years, Snapchat, TikTok. So there's more information than ever before. There's more advertisers than ever before. And how can we actually stand out above the noise? So mm. when we talk about being more competitive, DSOs, OSOs, obviously they've probably gotten a lot more aggressive with ad spend. When you look at big aligner companies, it's hard to outbid them from a Google ad standpoint. So how does small practice still keep the edge? Because that's really what I'm passionate about is private practice. You know, the bread and butter for us is startup to three or four million dollar practice. That's most of our partners. And I believe that's the best care is private practice. And so I think there are, there is a big advantage because you can move really fast. If you're in business for yourself, you know this, uh, as we've grown at hip, it can be frustrating sometimes because you can't move at the same speed. And so a private practice has a real advantage there. The patient experience is huge. So tightening that up, focusing on some of the boring things like operations, I asked a guy the other day, when's the time you, when's the last time you listened to a new patient phone call? He never had. And so we can unpack some more of these things as well, but I think it goes well beyond marketing, but you also still have to do marketing and the goal should really be omnipresence today. Now it depends on your goal and your budget, but you want to be everywhere. You want to be in the community. You probably still want to market to dentists, even though they may be a competitor, they're going to send the more complex cases to you. Mm -hmm. You probably want some type of sometimes mailer campaigns or billboards, and you want digital ads and you want a good website and SEO. Now that all sounds great, but what's my budget? What can I right. actually afford? It's very competitive. We hear this phrase in politics, like the rich get richer and the poor get poorer. I think we're seeing that in small business where it can be a winner takes all market and you see the people who do well just continue to do well and that's going to squeeze out some of the people who may not be adaptable and that's for any small business not just ortho yeah yeah great great information there and i i cannot agree with you more i look back having been in this industry for a little over 30 years now and I can tell you from when I was working in a practice and it was so one dimensional, our marketing strategies mm -hmm. to where we're at, where we're at now. And you did touch on it. I think that we cannot just lean on digital marketing or just mm -hmm. reaching out to the dentist or just being in the community. We're very strategic about where we're putting that money and how right. we are going after each of those markets. But yet keeping in mind that they're all important, especially, I think, from a startup perspective, when it's about brand awareness, we just need people to be aware that you're there. And as mm -hmm. you grow, it becomes about recognition in the sense that they will start to recognize your brand because they've seen it here and because they've seen it there and you're popping up in all of these places. And that's ultimately what we hope to get to. Yeah, um, just in looking at a sales funnel, this is a, a big lie, I think, where the sales funnel can be looked at two-dimensional, which is awareness and then decision. People should mm -hmm. be made aware of me and then they should just make a decision. Now, that's great. And I was talking to a guy the other day who wrote ads for the newspaper or publication. This was like 30 years ago. And back then you could make these crazy claims like your top 0.01% client. You'd write the claim around that. And it was like literally a money printer. Like it would just mm -hmm. print money. And that is just not the case today. So true. People are so guarded today. We hear all these stories. We have all these options. I could literally get a liner sent to my house probably in five minutes on my phone. 
And so what is the full sales funnel? You talked mm -hmm. about awareness. That's at the top. Getting some recognition. Okay, now maybe I'm considering, but I'm considering yeah. maybe against even something like horizontal, like a TV. I have to consider, am I going to buy a TV this month or braces? Mm -hmm. I have to consider, am I going to go with a DIYer or the local orthodontist, or I'm already have a dentist and they said they could do it. So now I'm in this consideration stage and then maybe I'm in a decision stage mm -hmm. and that decision stage could take a year in some yeah. cases more. And so I totally understand the whole desire to place an ad, get awareness and my practice just fills up. And sometimes that does happen. There, there are exceptions and we love it when that happens. Yeah, but hold, most hold, hold yeah. those fingers up again. We're, yeah. we're crossing our fingers Please. on that one. Yeah. But most of the time we have to be more realistic and have a good yes. expectation about the funnel. And I think it's just that orthodontists don't know. Nobody mm -hmm. tells them these things and they hear these success stories. And I do this too. I've been guilty of going and buying the thing and hope it just works. Mm. But in many cases, it can be too good to be true. So. Yeah. And I really appreciate that you took the time to just walk us through. And I, I love your analogy of a sales funnel because that really is what it is. And I have thought for a long time in our industry, even to the TC, the treatment coordinating room, the word sales for so long has been the taboo word. Oh, mm -hmm. we aren't doing sales. The reality of it is, folks, we are doing sales. This is mm -hmm. really is what we're doing and down to marketing as well. And I think that's such a good point to point out. And I do believe our younger docs understand that a little bit better because they sure. had this in front of them. A lot of times they're, depending upon their age, from the very beginning, there's components of sales that are baked into everything where maybe some of our senior docs and different generations have not had it so in your face per se. But I really love that analogy of thinking of it that way and just that buyer's journey. Oh. And it really is that. Gone are the days where you just take a referral from a dentist and go, well, because they told me to go to this doctor, therefore I go to it. It's like thinking that what we hear on the television is, is of course they said it, so therefore it must be right. Oh. We're definitely a gener different generation now, for sure. Totally. So let's talk a little bit about, I know a lot of listeners that are on the show are, are startup docs, younger docs that are getting into this. And this is a conversation I have a lot with doctors. And it's a hard one because not only is it hard to do a startup and to pick your location and to break into our industry, but it's very rare that we're going to do a startup or get a business started where we are not going to have competition. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, a lot of times our competition are the Goliaths out there. Mm. They're the DSOs and the OSOs that gosh, they've got a budget that we're like, man, if I can even make that much, I'll be happy, let alone that's yeah. just disposable, air quote, disposable money to put towards marketing. So I'm wondering what, what your advice is or some of the, I don't know, just strategies that you can talk about for younger doctors, especially when we're on a budget and we know mm -hmm. that we're looking to just cover our baseline expenses, those static expenses as we're getting going. H how do we position ourselves? And then also uh, think about this from a budget pers perspective as well. Yeah, I think it was true at Kathy who said, if we get better, then our customers will demand we get bigger. And so this is a massive area for private practice to win because I just don't think, and th this isn't to like slam DSOs or OSOs, but in large organizations from what I've seen, it could take a year to change one small thing because you have to then push that change across 50 locations or 300 locations. In a private practice, you could change something in an hour. And so looking at it from that perspective, if we get better, where do most people not like going? And especially for a doctor, they don't like going to the corporate entity. They don't like going to the hospital. 
they want to support the local doctor who is in the community. And a lot of people want to support local business in general. And so the beautiful thing about that, like for me, the best menswear store here in Pensacola is locally owned. The person's an expert. They can do alterations in the store. All these things that I couldn't get like at Dillard's or something. And mm -hmm. that's the comparison where you can have such a better experience and then you can use that experience in your marketing. So with testimonials, with reviews, in your copy, like we focus on these things, we make it fun. And that's why I love orthodontics is it is really fun. I'm seeing all these reels and TikToks and it's, man, I want to go there and it looks like they're having a big party. You can market that. And the whole experience can be thought through and fun. And you can be like the Chick-fil-A of your local market. DSOs and OSOs probably aren't going to do that. But you have to think yeah. that they are led by bankers. And at the end of the day, that is how they're making decisions. In some cases, I've seen practices post-transition where they're not as fun, or maybe they have mm -hmm. to adopt some of these systems that are more corporate. And that can be okay if that's what's best for the organization. But in terms of private practice, I think there's a major leg up there. Yeah. Yeah. That's great information. And I think it, you know, gives the single proprietor doctor practices just some hope that yes, it does feel like a little David and Goliath sometimes mm. when it comes to marketing, but as a as a single doctor practice or just a few location practice, I, I love what you said. You can pivot very easily. You can make moves. You can be nimble. You can. It's easy to pull the levers and mm -hmm. make make changes where you know what the bigger groups. It's like changing a big changing the the course of a big ship versus a little speedboat. Right. It's gonna take a long time for that rudder to kick in and start moving that that boat around. So I'm I'm curious what you might think about, I don't know, let's say you're talking to your sister who just started an ortho practice and she's, hey, Luke, I've only got this measly amount of money to spend. Where should I put my efforts? I only have so much earmarked. I'm probably, I'm not even paying myself yet. I'm, I'm still working yeah. hard to, to, to be an associate, to get to the point where I can pay myself. So I'm curious if you can talk to that doctor or your air quote sister sure. here about where, yeah. where would you advise they're going to get the best bang for their buck or what they should be looking at knowing that resources are not, we just can't keep pulling from yeah. the, the money tree. Totally. Hey docs, let's talk about Smile Suite because it's not just another scheduling system. It's a game changer in the world of new patient management. And as a proud Smile Suite partner, I've witnessed the incredible impact it has on practices of all sizes. Smile Suite means your new patient calls and web leads are expertly handled seven days a week, even during nights and weekends. And they offer top-notch customizable presentation software and seamless post-consultation follow-up. It's like having a secret weapon for your practice's success. Curious? Dive into the revolution at GetSmileSuite.com. And don't forget to mention Hey Docs to unlock some extra goodies. Elevate your practice with Smile Suite because every smile deserves a suite of excellence. First off, work with someone like Jill who can actually help you because I see so many people who get on calls with us and they have no budget. They've ran out of money and now marketing and getting new patients in the door has become an afterthought and kind of the last thing, which I get. But create some type of plan. Be proactive. When you're going to the bank or going to a finance partner, be thinking about all the pieces, not just what you need to practice at the level that you want to offer clinically. But first and foremost, you're now a business owner. And so how are you mm -hmm. going to get patients in the door. But what I would do if it was my sister, I would separate time and money. And time would be boots on the ground, shaking hands, meeting other business owners, getting out in the community as much as time allowed. 
On the money side, and, and we can go as deep as you want to go around this, Facebook and Instagram is going to be the most infinite lead source. However, it's the lowest quality. And when we mm. talk about that sales funnel, like yes. I talk to people all the time, you probably do too, when you're like, yeah, I work with orthodontists. And they're like, oh yeah, I just got a filling last week. And you're like, not the same thing. And so when we start talking about Facebook ads, I see people's guards come up and their feathers get ruffled. And yeah, we tried it and we got all these bad leads or people would opt in and then we couldn't get a hold of them. First off, just to show you how it works on my side of the fence, mm -hmm. I showed an orthodontist this the other day where we had to call him over three years, three different sales reps between text and phone calls and emails, 52 touches before he got on a call and then he became a client. Now, most people during that time would tell me that we're crazy. Why do you keep calling him? He wouldn't even respond. He's probably a bad lead. And this happens all the time in businesses everywhere. But again, it, it goes back to expectations. If we set the expectation of it's the lowest quality lead, but what can I do to make them more aware of the differences between orthodontist and dentistry, make them interested in our practice, move them forward to consideration, and then get them in the practice for a consult. And if we offer a better experience and we're within their budget and we're flexible, they're probably going to say yes if they have a need. So I think Facebook is the easiest source. When I say Facebook, it's now meta, so Facebook yep. and Instagram. That's going to be the easiest place in terms of a budget to get leads. But if all these things aren't right to nurture those leads, then you're probably going to say it was a waste of money. Then this can be challenging. And I know you deal with this all the time with startups. Staff is very limited. Yes. So how do you, especially now, it's very expensive too. And attrition is very high since COVID. So that's one thing when you brought up COVID that I didn't hit on is turnover is mm -hmm. really tough. But that is a challenge. And that's something that you're going to have to work through in terms of offering the right, I'll call it sales process. You could call it scheduling process. But that lead source is going to be the most infinite. And depending on what area you're in, you can get leads for between $5 to $100. Google's mm -hmm. going to be more expensive. It's more competitive, especially if you're um, bidding on things like Invisalign and clear aligners, because all these companies are running ads around aligners and Invisalign specifically keywords. And so it makes it very tough to compete in that space. And leads can be hundreds of dollars. Now, the caveat, they're further down the funnel because they're actually searching. Think about scrolling on Facebook or Instagram and we click on an ad. That's actually interruption. That ad interrupted hmm. what I'm doing. Now, I'll be the first to admit I'm uh, an easy sell. I'll buy things and some things I buy like I don't even use. I try to be more careful about that. But Think of most people opting in. It's so easy to opt in on these platforms. There's no attachment there. So when you mm -hmm. call them and they say, oh, yeah, that wasn't me, click. A lot of times it, it was them. They just aren't ready. And so if we look at it that way, if I'm an orthodontist or my sister, in this case, you had mentioned, I don't care as much about no-shows. I'm probably going to double book the slot if it's mm -hmm. a Facebook lead yep. and make the slot shorter because they may not show up. I'm even, if I get a hold of them, I may even pitch, hey, would you mind if we just move forward with a virtual consultation? Yes. It'll be easier for you. I'll text you a few images. We can get the process started now. My generation and younger are going to appreciate that. Yep. And so again, it's that adaptability. Think through things. Don't say, yeah, it's all bad leads because I can tell you right now, there's people adding millions of dollars in production from Facebook. So did they find this magic Facebook land of good leads or did they really go through the painful steps of tweaking all these systems? To Yeah, I really appreciate that answer. And I could not agree with you more. It is just about adjusting the dials or the levers and 
getting out of our traditional way of thinking about marketing and that it's mm -hmm. we do it this one way and we expect all of our patients to fall into this one little funnel of how they're going to interact with us and therefore it will result in 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 what whatever yeah. that that outcome is that we're looking for and i think we're seeing this just in general in our industry where there's a lot of disruptors right now going on just in the way we're treating patients to the way we're meeting patients I like to say, let's meet them where they're at. And I love it that you brought mm -hmm. up even thinking about it from a generational perspective. I've lectured on this a couple different times and said, we have never been in a, a time where we have had so many generations in our practices. And if you think yeah. about it, we've got all the way up to baby boomers, all the way down to alphas now coming into our practice. What an incredible, and if you were to say, I'm just going to continue to focus my marketing efforts on the way, the tried and true, the way we did it with Gen X and baby boomers versus thinking about the way we do it with millennials, and then the totally different way that we may do it with Gen Z or all, all, all of these different ones that are out there now, I think we're really missing the mark. And I, I mm -hmm. love what you're saying there about, hey, let's really think about we're thinking about marketing differently. Let's think about how we're meeting each of these patients. And we may have different strategies depending upon the way the leads are coming in and the type of leads that are mm -hmm. coming in into the practice. So I, I love that. I always say our, you may appreciate this or may not like it that I say this, mm -hmm. but for my docs, I, I always say a lot of our leads that are coming from online where they don't have a personal connection to us. They found us yeah, how, however it is, but it wasn't like a direct warm lead. I call those our B patients. We're going to be cautiously optimistic that they um, show up and that they start. But it doesn't mm -hmm. mean that we're not going to work on them and treat them and treat them as if they are, they could be a start. We just may have to alter where we're meeting them. I love that virtual. I'm going to take it back to the virtual. The other thing that you talked yep. a little bit about, and I don't want to get too much down down a rabbit hole on this one, but I don't think that we talk enough about leads. And mm. I feel like that is such an untapped market. And I think you were just talking about that even in, in the, the analogy, not the analogy, the story that you talked about the doctor that you have been contacting for multiple times. And yeah, I think it's not even something we talk much about when we think about marketing. And again, I don't want to get too much down the rabbit hole here, but I love that you brought that up because there is, sometimes we think about, they didn't call us back. So we're just going to mm -hmm. discontinue them and never think about them again, where with the right team and the right strategy, there is a whole nother campaign that we can mm -hmm. set up. And I know this is getting way in the weeds here on in in the marketing but i think i i foresee that we're going to see more and more of that coming into our industry where we are going to be dealing with drip campaigns and cold sure. leads and how are we without feeling like a used car salesman but still staying in front of them knowing that it is a buying process and that there is mm -hmm. more going on than just, I saw an ad and I call and I start, which I think was such an old way of thinking about the way we do it. Yeah. And I think that's why DIYers, that's what DIYers actually showed us is obviously we know the treatment level is not there, but they were really good at marketing and warming people up. And mm -hmm. I opted into all their funnels, so I'm still getting blasted by some of them. But I can tell you, the, the touch points are there and they don't give up. And so when people say, man, like, why do people choose them? Like, it's a, so obvious that I'm the better choice. It's because they were in communication with the person. So many times, and, and I'm curious your thoughts around this, because I know you deal with this a lot in your consulting. So many times we hear team members say, yeah, I called them once or I sent them a text. First off, like, where did you call them? Like, Where's this tracked? Okay. Exactly. But, you know, then you could get into what was said, what was the messaging. We see text messages go out that's, hey, Jill, if you're interested, call us back on this number. This maybe that's probably not the best text we right. could have sent. So we have to look at those things. But yeah, why not get 
leads and put them through a nurture campaign. And then again, if we're adaptable and we can tweak things easily, maybe we can have some videos in that campaign. Maybe we can introduce the different team members. And if it's built and it's automated in a CRM, it can just run its course. And some people are going to warm up to that and some people aren't. Then you could actually take all the dormant leads and put them in what we call a reactivation campaign and say you send out an offer or some type of invite to get them back in the practice a couple times a year. Now you're giving the, the most squeeze and you're reaping the reward from the ad spend that you are spending. And this could even go into your domain of working pendings. Yeah. I'll talk to people all the time and they're asking me, we call people one time and send them one text. Is that okay for pendings? No. So there's yeah. all this opportunity. <laughs> exactly. And especially now, after the big boom after COVID, I think we're two and a half years actually in a slow decline where ortho has actually been down. Now that's measured against the biggest year of all time post COVID. But if that is the case, I think that we have to get really creative and make the most of every opportunity. Yeah, for sure. That kind of leads me into my next question. And I think you guys have done a, a really good job at identifying this. And I think we're seeing more and more messaging around this, but really when the sales process begins. And mm. for so many years, we have all looked at it as, again, coming from where we were and how we did marketing to the sales process starts when that patient gets in the, in front of the TC and all the magic happens there. Curious to hear. I have my opinions on this, but I'm curious to hear where you guys are saying that sales process actually starts. And we'll leave it there first. Yeah. Where, where do you say it starts? Yeah. First off, the word sales, I believe everything is sales. And you could reword it as this influence. Whether it's church, a, a religion, let's not bring up the used car part, consulting, and you're trying to get a team to buy in to what you're saying, yep. down to actual transaction, it's all influence. And so I think first we have to change our mindset of even things like marketing and sales. They're not these dirty words. We, Sadly, there's been people who have done things that are unethical to paint that picture. But when we boil it down, it's not the case. For people who want to help people, you probably have to do some marketing and you probably have to do some sales probably have to work on the experience. And you could just call all of that, like, how can I influence more people? And the first touch point is wherever they hear or see your brand. That's when the process begins. Mm -hmm. So whether they go Google you and call the practice, and maybe that's more traditional, even a traditional way is the dentist hands them a referral card, and then they're going to call, or they see an ad, and they start thinking, is this for me? Do I need this now? Does little Johnny or Sally need, need braces? That's when it starts. And we have to also think about some things that consumers do. Have you ever seen an ad and screenshot the ad versus click the ad? I have. Mm -hmm. I actually yep. used to save them in my notes. Have you ever opened like the landing page or offer in your Safari app? I have an iPhone. And you don't do anything with it. It just sits there. I'll come look at this later. And so there could be all this time and distance between that first interaction and then moving forward. But there's all these steps that need to take place. But really the first place that sales process starts is wherever they hear or see it. It could be at a bridal expo. Yeah. It could be a friend at a, an event. And oh yeah, you should go see... Dr. Jill or whatever, yep. but that's where it starts. And then how does it continue? And as the owner, do we know all the touch points that are happening? I don't like micromanaging, but I do think that orthodontists who are in business for themselves have a responsibility to know, yeah, this is the level that matches our practice. This is the culture all the way from the ad or how I introduced the practice at a bridal expo or a lunch and learn all the way through the first phone call. I was on a call with somebody the other day 
And we were chatting and he was down for the year and we started talking about phones. And I said, okay, when's the last time you looked at your scripting? Because no shows are higher, bookings are down. So I get a team member while I'm on the call with them. I slack a team member and I say, hey, could you just call and record it? I send him the recording and I don't give him my thoughts. I just say, hey, what do you think? He probably stayed up because he responded late in the night. I and mean, now I feel bad. But he wrote me back this novel of, I had never, I haven't listened to a call in a decade. Here's all the things that are wrong with it. I'm embarrassed, so forth and so on. Now, the reality is it wasn't that bad. We're mm -hmm. our worst critic. But there was some sure. clear things to improve. And again, if we go back to the sister analogy of what would I tell my sister, it would be to make sure that what's happening at every touch point, I, you may know Dr. Uh, Moffat, who's in Australia, he built what it, all the touches, and I think he had 99 touches in his book, and he made sure that he gave the okay on every single touch, and then his team carried that out. Yeah, um, yeah. Yeah, that's great. And I think what you're talking about is that consistency with your messaging and yep. making sure that everybody on the team understands the importance of mm -hmm. that as well, because that, that's something we talk about. You never know whether who's going to answer that phone. We think it's going to be our front desk team that's trained on it, but it could be our clinical team. It could be, but beyond just who's picking up the phone, which I think we're half and half on how patients are interacting with us through phones. I think, it, and you said this a little bit earlier, but it's that messaging in how does our text sound? Is it consistent with the way we would answer the phones? Or is it this cold, dry, sounds like a robot wrote this type mm -hmm, of a text? Mm -hmm. Or the email that goes out, all, all these different touches, is there consistency where they're getting the same messaging, but also the same vibe or the same feel? As, as if it doesn't matter which method of communication they're choosing to interact with us, it, it doesn't feel like it's inconsistent or they're being catfished a little bit in the sense. And I know that's an mm -hmm. old phrase still in yeah. that. Wait a minute. I'm seeing this ad. I'm calling. And I'm getting a text. And I feel like this isn't even the same company. Yeah. Yeah. And we're talking about a lot here. And it, it is a lot. And it can be overwhelming. And so the practices that I see grow, I won't say easier because it's not easy, but the practices that continue to grow, even in a downturn, they're working with people like yourself. They're not afraid to go out and hire the consultant or the group to get help because there's so much more to do and think about in today's age. And I'd love to sit here and say it's going to get easier with AI coming and other platforms coming it's actually probably going to get harder and more competitive because to go back to the larger organizations, who's going to be the most innovative with AI? Probably they will because they have the funding. Now, again, I still think we have levers to pull, which we can focus on the human to human element. Ultimately, I don't really care what AI can do. It can't replace a human anytime soon. And so we can be more creative there. And there's still tools we can use and there's groups that we can work with to help. But it is a lot. It can be overwhelming and you need to find a place to start. And this could even turn into, I wanted to talk about creating short-term goals and long-term goals, actually mapping that out. And what do we need to focus on in the next 90 days? So many practices, they're just trying to survive and put out fires. Again, this transcends orthodontics, it's every small business, which is why so many fail, but you have to create short-term and long-term goals and you have to have some targets. Otherwise yeah. it, it's, there's just so much to do that a lot of times people do nothing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Such, such good insight for sure. So I want to switch gears a little bit and talk just a little bit. Have you talked to us just a little bit about, and we touched on this a, a little bit earlier, but marketing methods, one versus another. And I think that mm -hmm. there really is this, I don't know, perception out there. And, and I, I loved when you said a lot of times doctors think about marketing as everything else hasn't worked and they're like 
at the at, at the very bottom. And now they're saying, mm -hmm. okay, now I'll think about marketing. But I feel like a lot of times we think about marketing as the magic pill mm -hmm. to the, the flip side of it. If I just have good marketing, of course, I'm going to be successful. And I think you and I would both agree that it takes a combination of a good team, good marketing. It takes everything in place. But I'm curious if you can talk to that just a little bit and what you're seeing as far as one method versus another and how it correlates to success. Yeah, I've heard it all from don't ever run a Facebook ad to the only platform that works is Google to take the form off my website because we don't like those patients. You really hear it all. Yes. In terms of one being better than the other, there's a lot of factors. What type of practice do you want? Do you want something that is very boutique? that you're only going to serve uh, a specific age range where it's going to be, you're the top price in the area. Facebook may not be the best platform. You may get frustrated with it because it's more volume based. You're going to have to go through more at bats to win the patient. So maybe you do pour more into your website, SEO, educational materials as well as focus on some of the ground game things in the local community. I do think that the local community is overlooked a lot, especially by the people who are more bullish with social paid ads. We'll just run Facebook ads and yeah, we'll spend a ton of money there. And I don't want to waste my time going in the community. I don't want to talk to dentist anymore. And I see a missed opportunity there too, because it sometimes can be unpredictable or you could hit a lull. And so when one source may not be working as well this month, do I have other options? But yeah, it really depends. For instance, in Florida, where I am, Medicaid is okay. It's uh, better reimbursement. There's a lot of Medicaid practices, a low, lot of low fee models. People, I talk to a lot of people in there, but it's the Ben Burris model and you may like him or not like him, but he did do something innovative mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and that model could be really good on Facebook a and maybe more so than even making sense of spending money on Google ads. Yeah. So it really depends what the type of practice that you want. It depends on your area and your market. For instance, paid ads in Beverly Hills or New York City, it's going to take a lot more to make a dent. These are the most advertised markets in, in the world. And you have a tiny budget. And so right. it's really tough. So I do think it depends on multiple factors. But again, if we're just talking about leads, which could not mean anything other than somebody's opting in, the easiest place to go is Facebook. But it may not be the best place to go depending on the practice that you want. Sure. Oh, that's great. So I'm Curious as we finish up here, and you've just been dropping pearls this whole time, which is, <laughs> I know my audience has been on the edge of their seat. Oh, that was a good one. Oh, that was a good one. But as we're finishing up here, let's, I, I'd love it if you could give us, I don't know, three pieces of marketing advice. And again, you've been dropping us pearls this whole way, but if you've got maybe just a little bit more that if the doctors were to walk away, leave this show and be like, okay. I can implement this right away, or I can really start thinking about this um, mm -hmm. right away. What would those be? One of the biggest, I think, is just mindset. Again, starting to, to take on the mindset of you're a business owner first, and then the artist and the orthodontist second. And I know that can be really tough, but if you want a viable business, you have to do it. So starting to read books like The E-Myth or entrepreneurial stories or studying these business owners who have paved the way, we can find out the information. That's the beautiful thing about today. It's all at our fingertips. So Absolutely. mindset, number one, if it were me, I would find a way to make Facebook work in my practice. If you're sitting here listening saying, oh my goodness, I can't believe you're saying that, or I really can't try it again. Again, it's an infinite source. You, you can spend a lot of money there because it's just impressions and you're not necessarily bidding for limited keyword search, but it's the lowest quality lead. So can I install the right systems automation to make it work? 
And then lastly, I was listening to a podcast from, I think it was the Scheduling Institute, and something really stood out to me that was on that podcast was the human capital. And the phrase that I remember was, if the human capital's not right, don't invest in marketing. And so that last, that, yeah, that third thing would just be people. It's become really tough. You probably have to have some leadership skills. And you have to probably have some type of incentives where as you grow, your team can grow and what's in it for them. I talked to so many orthodontists. I'm like, yeah, how do you incentivize your team? Oh, I don't do that. It's just, it's a simple gig. It should be low pay. And maybe it is hourly, but there has to be an upside. There has to be something that they can see growth in your business because if not, they can quit and literally go work for Amazon or Facebook and they can just roll out of bed and hop on a computer and they're at work. And so what's going to keep good people in your practice? And people is the name of the game. If you don't have good people, you cannot grow. Yeah, exactly. It's like the book, Who Not How, right? All about your who's. You as a doctor should not be the one figuring it all out. You surround yourself with good who's, whether it's a company or whether it's an investment into a live body in your practice. But that that is the key to success right there is who you're s- surrounding yourself with. Great, great, good advice. So if somebody wants to get a hold of you guys, if they're like, all right, Luke, Luke had some good information. I just want to I just want to get some questions answered. Maybe this is the right time for me to really jump in and really take my marketing seriously. What's going to be the best way they can do that? Sure. I'd love to talk to anyone who has questions. Uh, you could email me directly. It's Luke. So that's L-U-K-E at hip creative inc. That's H-I-P creative I-N-C dot com. Wonderful. All right, Luke, the way I like to finish up my podcast is I like to throw everybody into a quick speed round. Are you ready? Uh -uh. Are you ready to accept the speed round challenge? (laughs) All right. If you could start any business right now, what would it be? That is a great question. I would probably start the same business and maybe multiple agencies in different verticals. The way that we built HIP is on a niche. And I really believe in niching down and focusing on one vertical. So it would probably be the same business, just in a different vertical. Yeah. Great. What's the best investment you've ever made? The best investment I've ever made is actually investing in creating a family. That's where I like to spend my time. If I could spend all of my time with my family, I'll say I would love it. Maybe I wouldn't. Distance makes the heart grow fonder. I don't know. But For me, that has been the biggest reward is my family, seeing them grow. I have two kids and live out on a farm. And so we have fun. Oh, that sounds wonderful. How do you handle work-related stress? So any stress, and this may be interesting for some people, I tell myself that it's really not that big of a deal. I love history. So whether it's going and watching some documentary on World War II and envisioning myself in somebody's someone else's shoes that's way more difficult while everyone's life has ups and downs i truly believe there's never been an easier time to do whatever it is you want to do from start a business you have an inner you have the internet but you could run a business somewhat here maybe not so well maybe you need a bigger screen but the most stressful situation i've ever been in is probably not that big of a deal compared to somebody who had to storm the beaches of Normandy. Mm -hmm. So thinking about who's come before us and made it to where we have it pretty easy, that's what helps me. And I love biographies. So whether it's JW Marriott or studying people like Truett Cathy, who had to create businesses in the depression, he had Uh, businesses burned to the ground. His business partner, his brother died in an airplane crash. That's really tough. I've got it pretty easy. Yeah. Yeah, That's what I I love that. And it's really keeping it in perspective a a lot of times. Not not that some of us can't go through tragedies for sure, but a lot of times it's just perspective looking at it. Yeah, totally. So as, as we finish up here, one trend in our industry that you're excited about? AI. Yeah. I think AI is going to be a massive driver. I don't think it's going to replace people. I think it's going to come down to how do people leverage the tool. Mm -hmm. Yep. I I totally agree with you. 
And then final question, most valuable piece of advice you would give somebody starting their business? All the way, jump all in. Don't try and say, I'm going to try and go about it the cheapest way. I'm going to try and do it myself. I get that. I can respect that. But I see people come back and say it didn't work. Most of the people where it works, again, this transcends orthodontics. They went all in. They went through all the pain first. Bill Gates talks about the 10 dark years of starting the business where he was like sleeping there. I'm not saying do that, but it's going to be tough. Mm -hmm. Do it right. Go through the pain one time yeah. of of starting and do it the right way. Yeah, that's I, I love it. Just do the work. It's, it's, there are just do times it. you just have to do the work and trust in yourself. You're going to mm -hmm. you'll do just fine. Luke, again, thank you so much for being on Hey Docs with us. This is a great episode and I know. We're going to have a lot of listeners that took a lot of notes, and I'm sure we'll be giving you a call and at least asking their marketing questions. And, sure. And I'm sure a lot will be jumping on and saying, all right, I'm ready. <laughs> uh, let's do this. <laughs> so thank you again. Thank you for having me. It was a pleasure. Really appreciate it. Yeah. All right. Till next time.